But when his mother popped into the house to make a cup of tea, the delighted shriek stopped, replaced by an eerie silence. William was gone. What followed on the morning of September 12, 2014, would become the largest search in Australia's history. After extensive searches and hundreds of interviews, police had a theory of the case. Darkcast Network. Welcome to the dark side of podcasting. A three-year-old boy dressed in his favorite Spider-Man suit was playing with his older sister at his grandmother's house. The home in Kendall, New South Wales, Australia, was in the woods and offered plenty of space for little William Tyrrell to run around. But recent developments have made everyone question what they believe they know about the case of William Tyrrell. So what really happened to the little boy in the Spider-Man suit? When a person goes missing, there's a special kind of pain in the not knowing. I want to tell you the stories of those who never came home. Today, I want to tell you the story of William Tyrrell. I'm Kona Gallagher. And I'm Ethan Flick. And this is And Then They Were Gone. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back. Thank you for joining us once again. I am Kona Gallagher. And I'm Ethan Flick. And we're the husband and wife team behind this podcast. Each week, I tell you the story of an unsolved missing persons case. Ethan doesn't know anything about the case going into the episode, and he's here to provide his reactions and questions in real time, hopefully asking some of the same ones you have at home. Now, this week, we are going back to Australia. Uh, this is the second case that we've covered from there, Eloise Worlidge being the first. So are we uh, getting big in Australia now? <laughs> no, they we're, uh, they're number four in terms of countries that listen to us. This had been suggested by a listener. And so I was going back through some of our listener case suggestions, um, which if you have a case, we have a link in the show notes that you can submit it to. And I thought that this might be a good one to do. And what what's interesting about this is a lot. I mean, this case is completely bonkers. But just based on the two cases in Australia that I've looked at, they do not mess around when it comes to missing children. Like both of these investigations are just incredibly intense. Cool. Yeah. I mean, yeah, not cool. But right. Well, I mean, it's always good when we see like a good response from law enforcement. Exactly. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, the case itself, like every theory kind of seems simultaneously probable and improbable. Like nothing really makes sense. Um, but as of this recording, it's been nine years since little William Tyrrell has been seen and something happened to him. The charges that were just filed seem to maybe answer questions, but we truly don't have definitive answers yet. Now, this case is so intricate uh, that we're actually going to be doing a two-parter on it. Mm. It's been a while since we've done one of these. I actually don't even know if we've had one this season. Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't. I don't think so. Yeah, it's been a long time. So the good news is that those of you who who are on our Patreon or who subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts will get part two, which is next week's episode right after this one. So you won't have to wait. So now let's get into part one of the case of William Tyrrell. William Tyrrell was born on June 26, 2011 in Sydney, Australia. Truthfully, the Sydney part of this is actually a guess. I mean, that's where he was living at the time of his disappearance. Now, for regular listeners of this show, you know that this is where I typically talk about the missing person's family. Like, I kind of 
start off with the biographical details. Yeah, like right. they were born, you know, in X on this state to these parents and they have these siblings. Unfortunately, I don't have that information in William's case. At the time of his disappearance, William was in foster care, a fact that actually wasn't made public until three years after he went missing. Three years? Yeah. Why would they keep that a secret? It's a weird Australian law like that I've never heard of. So there's some sort of law that says that like you're not allowed to publicize whether or not a child is in the foster care system. So... All of the early news reports about William's disappearance is like, you know, he was with his parents at his grandmother's house, et cetera, Uh et cetera. A foster care advocate named Alana Smith actually had to go to court to basically get a judge to rule that they were allowed to say that he was in foster care. That's really bizarre. It is. And so, like, William's birth parents are alive and they weren't really allowed to speak or do anything for three years. And it's interesting because um, his mother, his birth mother actually did do a, an interview in 2015 about a year after his disappearance, but it wasn't aired for several years after that. Hmm. Yeah. The whole thing is really, really interesting. I mean, I guess that has to do with some sort of protection clause, but it just doesn't seem like that. It seems like it's extra work in a case like this. It is. It is. And a lot of people think that it harmed the case at the beginning, you know, especially because, you know, the parents, uh, biological parents, the foster parents, they weren't really allowed to be as public as as we normally see in these cases, Mm -hmm. you know, going and holding news conferences and making appeals and, and things like that. So it's an interesting one for sure. So who are William's foster parents? To this day, we still don't have their names. Really? Yes. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But every interview they've done has left out their names. And when they went on Australia's 60 Minutes to mark the one-year anniversary of William's disappearance, they were permitted to do so only if their faces were not shown. So this was before the 2017 decision that even allowed the mention of William being in foster care. So this they do an entire 60 Minutes interview where they Under were, the assumption of being William's actual parents. Correct. And their faces aren't shown. That's really wild. It is. So because of this, we have very little information on these foster parents, other than the fact that the father's a businessman and the family lives in a $4 million home on Sydney's North Shore. Jesus. Mm-hmm. In a Daily Mail Australia article published in the summer of this year, 2023, we finally learn about the circumstances that led to William and his sister being placed in state care. William was born to a young couple who has also not been named. His biological mother had previous issues with the police, including an incident on her 22nd birthday in which she punched a cop in the face. Uh, That's not good. Yeah. She and William's father, who worked as an excavator, became a couple in 2009 when she was 20. William's sister was born in 2010, and William was born in 2011. Now, the couple lived in public housing and had a tumultuous relationship. They had actually been broken up, I think, before she got pregnant with William, and then kind of got back together and had him. And that whole punching a cop in the face, it was on her 22nd birthday, so that was like right around the time that, you know, like William was born or I don't know if it was right after or something. So the police had basically been called to their residence several times for loud arguments and things of that nature. This led to the pair being ordered to take domestic violence classes and to stay away from each other. Mm. So it got that bad. Yeah. And it sounds like during this time when William was about nine months old, he was put into temporary care and it seems like it was a bit of back and forth. So it's Again, we just don't have a lot of details on this whole thing because, you know, I heard there were some reports that just came out recently that said that he was put in care at seven months old. This article said nine months old. But from what it sounds like, it was just, like I said, back and forth. But when William was 11 months old, I'm not sure if it was his mother who was supposed to have him or his father, but the mother and father were not supposed to be together. 
But either way, welfare workers spotted the couple together with William at a video store and decided that, you know, hey, William needs to be out of their custody. William's paternal grandmother told the Daily Mail that she helped them hide out. So basically, they got spotted. They weren't supposed to be together. They were going to take William away. And so he went to his mom and was like, hey, you need to hide us. And she was like, yeah, absolutely. <sighs> yeah, this story is already... I know. Starting off wild. It's a lot. And so I, what I don't know is where William's older sister was at this time. Mm-hmm. Like, because they just don't mention her. So I don't know if she was also with them, but they're focusing on William. Or potentially already in foster care. Right. Yeah. I have no idea. So after about three months, the Family and Community Services Department, which is basically like CPS, mm-hmm. um, and they call it FACS. So I'll be referring to it as FACS. They caught up with the family and William was removed from their care. Now, this is how William ended up with the wealthy North Shore family. The biological parents wanted their son back and they spent about $4,500, which is a ton of money to them, on lawyers in an attempt to retain custody of William, but they were unsuccessful. Now, it does seem as though both William and his older biological sister were placed with the North Shore family. At first, William's parents were allowed to see their children three times a week, but the foster parents soon began to fight against that level of access. That's interesting that the foster, like, that they would even have the ability to, to, to fight against that. I mean, this foster care is temporary. Well, it's supposed to be, but it doesn't seem that that's the way this couple was using it. So William's foster mother said, and I don't, I think this is in like a letter that she wrote to fax or the caseworker or something. She said, quote, William was very unsettled, particularly the time immediately following contact with his birth parents. The unsettled behavior after visits would last months, end quote. This is a big, big deal with this case. Um, That has kind of been the undercurrent of it, which is really looking at Australia's foster care system. And we're going to talk a lot about that because what's interesting is, you know, here the goal with foster care is reunification. Right. So if possible, they want to reunify children in the system with their biological family. Mm -hmm. Of course, There are many reasons and instances in which that is not possible. And then that leads to, you know, more permanent placements or adoptions. But as we saw in the Orrin and Orson West case, there doesn't seem to have been really any attempts at reunification with William. So the children, um, William and his sister, were also encouraged to call their foster parents, mommy and daddy, which they began to do. William's biological mother said that her son continued to call her mom up until their second to last visit together, during which he referred to her as birth mom. Uh. By then, she and William's father were only allowed to see him for one hour every seven to eight weeks. Yikes. Yeah. I mean, that's a lot. And, you know, it's interesting. And again, we just don't know this couple's full history. It seems like there were drugs involved. I don't know what to what extent. Mm-hmm. There was definitely domestic violence, but it doesn't I've never read anywhere that there were any allegations of either of the parents being abusive toward the children. It seems like they would get drunk and fight each other. Right. Which it's not that's, great. I mean, obviously, yeah, I'm still not a, da- saying, a dangerous situation for kids to be in. For sure, but to me, that's not a situation where you're like, okay, they need to be out of the house forever and there's no fixing that there's no coming back from it. You know, like it seems that that's a situation in which intervention can happen. Therapy can happen. Things can happen in order to work toward unification, reunification. Right. But like you said, we don't have the, uh, the, the full details no, on absolutely it. So not. they might be refusing services or, just generally not going along with whatever program was set up for them. And that could absolutely be true. But we do know that they did fight legally to retain custody. So one would think that if they're in court and spending all this money, that they would also be doing the things that they're supposed to be doing. But I mean, who knows? We just don't know. Right. And they're also going up against, they're spending $4,500 going up against somebody that lives in a $4 million house. Exactly. They were outgunned from the beginning. William's parents could feel their little boy slipping away from them. 
And his biological mother would later say that she was concerned. She said that William would show up for visits dressed inappropriately for the weather, and he would have bruises on him. We have three boys, and we're talking about a three-year-old here. Bruises are not uncommon in right. the, at all. But some were certainly concerning. On their last visit, William had a black eye. Mm. And ostensibly, this is from a furniture climbing accident, which, again, sounds Could completely happen. plausible. Mm-hmm. But a black eye is a black eye, and that's still very concerning. Yeah. More distressing is this account given to police by William's foster father shortly after his disappearance. He told them that only in the last week, so like the week before he disappeared, William had been sitting on a stool in their kitchen, fallen off, and couldn't get back up. What does that mean? I don't know. And I'm going to read you the actual quote from the foster father, and I still don't know what it means. But here we go. So let's see if you can make any sense of this. Quote, if he's fallen and he's fallen backwards, that seemed to indicate to me that he had a problem with getting back up, but he couldn't get back up, which is something that has distressed me a bit. And I think for a boy that size and age would find that a little bit awkward. I mean, if eventually I wasn't there, he probably would have gotten himself out of it by just rolling. But they don't think about those sorts of things. They think, oh, I'm in a position I can't get out of. And daddy, daddy's here. And daddy, daddy. So, you know, you help them up and he's all fine. End quote. So maybe he was in like some sort of secured high chair or something. Maybe it wasn't like an open-ended stool, perhaps. I don't know, because he says, I mean, if eventually I wasn't there, he probably would have gotten himself out of it by just rolling. Well, yeah, get out out of it. it. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. I I don't know. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, that's weird. Yeah. So I don't know. You all can make of that what you want. But I mean, it is scary that he apparently fell and couldn't get back up, fell backwards. I mean, maybe hit his head. I don't know. Yeah, just the the phrase "get out of it." Yeah, to me, it it makes it seem as though he was in some sort of semi secured high chair or something. Yeah, and that could very well be the case. I just I don't know. Yeah, it wasn't publicly known then, but Williams' foster parents said that they had many difficulties with the child, difficulties that they chalked up to him still being able to visit his biological parents. In recently released documents, the foster mother said that William, quote, had personal issues, particularly towards me, end quote. The dad? The mom. Oh, the mom. Mm -hmm. She went on to say, quote, we had to deal with things such as William hitting me, biting me, and him being basically furious, end quote, with another child in the house. And again, I don't know if this is his biological sister or another foster child. Mm -hmm. These parents have been referred to as stars in the foster care system. They have no biological children of their own, but it does sound like they've had several foster children and continue to have foster children in their house, you know, up until recently. Though I'm not sure of the duration, right? It sounds like William and his sister were placed in their home pretty soon after they got approved to be foster parents. So I don't know if there were other kids before them. I I just... I don't know. Again, there's just so much secrecy around this Uh that it's really kind of hard to piece together. But, you know, she talks about how like William was having all these issues. He was a baby. You know, he was like 11 months old when he came to them. Right. So the aggression may not have been targeted specifically to her. It just could be that he is a child. Yeah. And he's a child who's been disrupted for most of his young life but it's weird it's like it's almost like she's attributing malice right to the actions of a literal baby right so despite these difficulties and without william's biological parents knowledge the foster parents had begun talks to formally adopt william and his sister oh okay Keep in mind that William's biological parents were still trying to get him back, but it didn't seem as though the state was assisting them at all. According to foster child advocate Alana Smith, quote, The removal was systematically calculated. The plans to adopt without consent or knowledge was by all means heading down the path of a forced adoption, end quote. Do you think it was calculated by the foster parents or calculated more by facts or a combination? I think a combination. 
I think that these parents couldn't have children of their own and they were using the foster system to complete their family. Uh. Keep in mind, at this point, when they're trying to adopt these kids, the foster parents hadn't even met the biological parents. So where did the meetings take place? Was that through fax? Yeah, they were all handled by a third party. They fax actually worked with the Salvation Army. So they had a point of contact at the Salvation Army who would be the one who would facilitate these meetings. So these foster parents are trying to adopt a child or two children without even having a conversation with the biological parents who loved him and desperately wanted him back. On August 21st, 2014, William's birth mother and father see their son at a Chipmunks Play Center at Macquarie Park, Northern Sydney. They had missed their June visit because the mother was sick, so this visit was two hours instead of one. At the visit, they gave William shoes and clothes and hugged and kissed him goodbye. It would be the last time they ever saw their son. All right, so now let's get into the timeline of William's disappearance. Okay. Now, this is mainly from an article published in 2019 in the New Zealand Herald. In September 2014, the foster mother's mother was preparing to sell her house on Benaroon Drive in Kendall. The foster mother made plans to take the kids up with her husband and help her mom sort through the property prior to the sale. So we're talking about the foster grandmother here. Okay. The original plan was to go up on Friday, September 12th, but at the last minute, the couple picked William and his sister up from daycare and headed up on Thursday, September 11th. They made the four-hour drive with a few stops and arrived around 9 p.m. The children were then put to bed in separate rooms. The next morning, September 12th, the kids awaken between 7 and 7.30. They wake their foster grandmother at 8. William pulls out all of his toys and begins playing with them, making a lot of noise. (laughs) As you do. Yeah, right? And it frustrates his foster father. The family has breakfast at 8.30. The foster grandmother's washing machine was broken, and she had had a repairman out a few days prior to take a look at it. He, I think, was waiting on a part to come in so that he could finish the job. Okay. So at 9.03, the foster mother calls the repairman, a man named Bill Spedding, to see if the part has come in, but the call goes to voicemail. At Mm 9.03? That's very specific. Well, yeah, because they had phone records. Okay. Shortly after this call, the foster father decides to go into town to pick up some prescriptions and make a few business calls. The children played outside on the veranda. Now, there are two verandas in this house. There's one which is basically a high deck, like on the second, third floor. Okay. Um, But the veranda that they're talking about, I believe, is um, a lower deck. So it's like two steps off the ground, basically. Almost like a front porch? Yeah. Okay. But I forget like what's in front of the house and what's in back of the house. But yes, in, in any case, the veranda that they're playing on is very low to the ground. The foster mother says that William was, quote, jumping out of his skin with energy, end quote. They began playing a game in which she and William were roaring like lions. She takes a photo of him mid-roar, dressed in the two-piece Spider-Man costume that had become his favorite outfit. It would be the last photo ever taken of him. And this photo was taken right before he disappeared. Yeah, like minutes before. Now, shortly after this, William gets bored and jumps off of the veranda to run around in the grass. So this is a large home in a quiet neighborhood of homes on one acre lots. So he had plenty of room to run around and play. The foster mother and grandmother go into the home to make a cup of tea. And after a few minutes, they realize that they don't hear William anymore. Now, I want to pause real quick and say that nothing that I've read talks about where his sister is during all of this. Yeah, I was going to ask that. Yeah, exactly. Because that's my question. I'm like, okay, cool. Where's the sister? Is she in with the, you know, mom and grandma? Is she out with William? Is she still on the veranda? No idea. I don't know. Like, and so she was young herself, I think not quite five. Yeah, but that's, I mean, that's still a potential witness that we don't know. Yeah. Where she's at. I know. And it's wild because over all of the years, we hear so very little about her. So obviously, I have a million questions regarding that, but unfortunately, zero answers. 
The only thing that I have comes over a year later in December 2015, when the foster mother says that William's sister may have been the only witness to the abduction and that she knows a, quote, bad person took William, end quote. Then I guess she was out there somewhere. Somewhere. Yeah, I guess. Maybe. (laughs) Do we have any corroborating witnesses on the foster father not being there? You said he he left to go fill prescriptions. Do we have anybody that can that has verified that? No, um, I believe though he was making Skype calls. Okay, um, so there is some evidence that it wasn't him. Yeah, okay. exactly. It does seem that there's evidence that he was doing something else. And like I said, he was going to the pharmacy to pick up prescriptions. So I'm sure they were able to corroborate that. Yeah. All right. So back to the timeline. Now, around 1030, William's foster mother goes outside to see why he's so quiet, but she doesn't see William. She walks around the property calling his name, but can't find the little boy. During this, which she doesn't see this text right away, but her husband texts to say he's five minutes away. He arrives and she tells him that she can't find William. He just bolts and like he apparently instantly goes into panic mode And just starts looking around the property and in the nearby woods or bush, they call it bush. bush. Got it. Yeah. The foster mother starts knocking on neighbors' doors and soon she has other women out there helping her search for William. At 10.56 a.m., she calls triple zero, which is Australia's 911, and tells the dispatcher that she is a little boy who has been missing for about 10 to 15 minutes. Here's part of her call. Police emergency, this is Simone. Yeah, hi, my son is missing. He's three and a half. Okay. Um... Sorry? What's your address? Center Moon Drive, yep. Kendall. How long has he been missing? I th- well, I think, well, we've been looking in for him now for about 15 or 20 minutes, but okay. I thought it could be five, it could be longer, because he was just playing around here. We heard him, and then we heard nothing. Okay. So he's been missing since about 10.30? Yeah, I'd say so. Okay. Can you describe him to me? How tall? Obviously not very tall. No, but he's, he'd, be, he'd be about two and a half feet. He's wearing a Spider-Man outfit. What kind um, of hair has he got? He's got um, dark, sandy-colored hair. It's short, and he's got really big, uh, brown and green colored eyes. Okay. Well, so you get any foods on? Do you know any any other distinguishing features? Um, 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 he has... Oh, he's got a freckle on the top of his head when you part the hair on the left-hand side. Yeah. You'll see a freckle on the top of his head. Okay. All right. Do you know where he might have gone? Um, we're li- we actually live, well, none properties near a state forest. Okay. And they're on huge blocks. We've walked up and down Benaroon Drive and we can't find him. Okay. What's his name? William. What's William's surname? Uh, Tyrrell. T-Y-R-R-E-L-L. Okay. Has he been known to sort of go anywhere? No, this is the first time. The first time completely out of character. There wasn't anyone um, suspicious in the area, any vehicles? No, or? no, no, no. Okay. Well, not that I'm, no, not that I'm aware of. We were just, I was out there talking with mum and my other daughter, so. Okay. And we heard him roaring around the garden, and then I thought, oh, I haven't heard him. I better go okay. check on him and okay. All right. find him. We'll send police to see you at Benaroon Drive in Kendall. Yes. Or so we have a window of potentially 25 to 26 minutes. Yeah. Where they are out looking for William before mm-hmm. the phone call. Yeah, that's what it sounds like. There, She said that there's a, a state park Yeah, adjacent to the property. Mm-hmm. So that's a, big, uh, that's a pretty big area. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of really thick, heavy brush out there. And I mean, the searchers, you know, not to jump ahead a little bit, but they talk about how like they're wearing like overalls and stuff when they go out, but everything's so dense and crazy that like their overalls are getting torn to shreds. And this kid's like wearing a little play suit. And so they're like, there's no way that he could have gotten more than five meters without leaving a sign basically. Okay. So I guess we should wait to Yeah, so yeah, get that's jumping search. ahead a bit. Um so yeah, police arrive about ten minutes later, um ten minutes after the nine one one call, triple zero call, at eleven oh six. Police and volunteers begin to search the woods and they begin a house to house search as well. One of the neighbors posts on Facebook appealing for help. Around this time, William's foster mother calls her point of contact at the Salvation Army to inform them of the situation. 
The Salvation Army works with facts to facilitate the foster process, including the visits with the birth parents, as we talked about before. Right. Speaking of the birth parents. Yeah, I, I okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wanted to find out where they were. Yeah, they're back in Sydney, which is four hours away. Confirmed. Yeah, because police bang on their door and enter their apartment at about 4 p.m. They like come in hot, apparently. And William's biological mother is apparently heavily pregnant at this point. She has no idea what's happening. These cops come bursting in her door and basically just start yelling at her. And eventually she figures out that William is missing. So she's like crying. She's confused. She's terrified. And eventually ends up showing them ATM receipts to prove that she was actually nearby shopping, you know, that morning around the time that William disappeared. Okay. What about biological father? Yeah. So he wasn't home at the time. So he arrives home and is, again, informed that his son is missing and replies, he's fucking what? Which... I think is exactly the That's response. Definitely you would appropriate. Have. Yeah. Yeah. And so they also, of course, make him provide an alibi, but he was also able to prove that he was in Sydney at the time. The search continues throughout the day before stopping for the evening. Temperatures fall to 13.2 degrees overnight, which is 55.76 degrees Fahrenheit. So not freezing, but cold not for warm. a little boy who is in, in a Costume. costume yeah. yeah and we'll talk about this a little bit later but there's also a possible discrepancy as to whether or not he had shoes on and it's really frustrating because in that triple zero call the dispatcher asks the mother kind of a couple of questions at once right and one of them was is he wearing shoes yeah i did hear that but the mom doesn't you know re- doesn't respond she doesn't to that. answer that question she asks she answers like one of the other questions that the dispatcher asked at the same time. So she doesn't answer that. In the photo that's taken just minutes before his disappearance when he's on the veranda, he has bare feet. Uh. But apparently in one of her statements, she said that he had shoes on when he disappeared because she was afraid that he was going to step in dog poop and, and whatever. But the dog was dead. Like the grandma used to have a dog, but didn't have a dog at the time. So there's some question about the shoes, which comes up, you know, years later, literally years later. Mm. So the search goes, you know, all day until dark and then resumes at 6 a.m. the next morning. Search and rescue dogs are brought in as well as police helicopters. Other volunteers, including surf lifesavers, the rural fire service and locals on horseback arrive with trail bikes and with their own dogs to search and scrub near Benarin Drive and the Kendall and Middle Brother State Forests. The search continues throughout the weekend, with the dogs picking up no trace of William's scent beyond the foster grandmother's property. By September 15th, a task force is created called Strike Force Roseanne. Sex crimes officers are put in the group, and they start looking into the startling number of registered sex offenders in the area. Oh, that's not good. Yeah. Yeah. Now, this next part isn't known to the public at the time, but on September 18th, which is almost a week after the disappearance, the foster mother begins to add to her story. She says that she remembers three strange cars being on Benaroon Drive before William's disappearance. The uh, Yeah, the, the fact that the canines weren't picking up William's scent beyond the property, that's immediately where my mind goes is that he was in a car yes. yeah absolutely yeah. so like i said these houses all had one acre lots and these two cars uh, were apparently parked like end to end between two driveways like across the street and and there's like no real reason for those cars to be any cars to be parked in between two driveways like it was just weird mm-hmm. but this isn't something that she mentioned until several days later and the dispatcher does ask her if there are any strange cars, and she says no, but again, you know. It, heat, of, heat of the moment. Yeah. Right. She also gives a second police statement and says while searching for William on September 12th, she heard a quick, sharp, high-pitched scream from the reeds and a grassy knoll. The sound was, quote, like when a child hurts themselves, but then she says, quote, maybe it was a bird, end quote. But searchers were already out there. At that, no, in, I think this might. I think she might mean when she was searching prior to calling the police. Okay. 
After a week, the physical search is called off with no trace of the small boy being found. The foster parents return to their home at Sydney, and, you know, the task force is still investigating, obviously. And the pedophile angle is becoming more and more prominent by this point. As the months go on, police begin to zero in on a suspect, washing machine repairman Bill Spedding. In January 2015, police secured a search warrant for Spedding's Bonnie Hills home, along with his pawnbroker business and an adjoining office. The search was incredibly public, and neighbors saw police carry away a mattress and a computer for further examination. They also drained his septic tank. Shortly thereafter, Bill closed his pawnbroker business and basically went into hiding. He made several statements denying any involvement in William's disappearance, but the suspicion and the media scrutiny were intense. And I find it so interesting because throughout all of this, and going back to that 60 Minutes interview, which we'll have on our blog, you know, we don't know the names of the foster parents. We don't know the names of the biological parents. But we know the name of the washing machine repairman. Oh, yeah. And the lead investigator is talking about this dude using his name like showing photos of him, everything. That's wild. Spedding says that he was only at the Kendall house once on September 9th, 2014, two days prior to William's arrival. He was supposed to come back on September 18th to finish the repair job, but didn't for obvious reasons. Right. And then there was that 903 call. Yeah, to his voicemail. Right, that went straight to his voicemail. Mm Mm-hmm. As Spedding became a person of interest, police told ABC News that they had received an anonymous tip that Spedding was a pedophile. Now, keep in mind, he has no criminal history of this whatsoever. Okay. Yeah, but they were already like looking into this sex offender angle, right? So they received this anonymous tip. And according to police... They then investigate these allegations and end up charging Spedding with historical child sex offenses. What the hell does that mean? That means, and apparently the the statute of limitations is very different there because this is 2014, 2015, and they charge him with child sex offenses dating back to the 1980s. So what they're saying is that he did something to kids yeah. 30 plus years ago. How the hell did they get evidence of that? Yeah, well, they didn't. And the charges were eventually dropped due to lack of evidence. That's fucking crazy. Yeah, it is. And Spedding and his legal team alleged that they were only filed those charges as part of a smear campaign to put pressure on him. Wow. Yeah, and this went on for years And in 2019, just ahead of the five-year anniversary of William's disappearance, Spedding announced that he was going to sue the New South Wales police for reputational damage. In December 2022, Spedding was awarded $1.5 million in the case. The courts found that then-lead investigator in William's case, Gary Jubilin, concocted the strategy of charging him with these historical crimes to put pressure on Spedding to give evidence on William's whereabouts, which is exactly what Spedding said. Right. The New South Wales police appealed, and just a few months prior to this recording in 2023, the courts upheld the ruling and awarded Spedding an additional $300,000 in interest. (sighs) Jesus. Saying, quote, the high-handed, self-serving, grandstanding undermining of the criminal justice system by the relevant police officers in arresting, charging, opposing bail, and maintaining the prosecution against Mr. Spedding has no relevant comparator in the reported cases in NSW. One can only hope that its standing as the worst case is never repeated and is never superseded by conduct that is even worse, end quote. That's pretty damning. Yeah, like that is harsh. Now, in addition to spending, the investigation also targeted actual pedophiles in the area. On April 17th, 2015, Police revealed that they were investigating reports of a pedophile ring operating in the area. 
As the first anniversary approached, police began to make more information about their investigation public. On September 7th, they put out an appeal for two cars described as a dark gray, old model, medium-sized sedan, and an old white station wagon that were parked across from the house on the day that William disappeared. They also wanted to identify a dark green or grayish colored sedan that drove past William's foster grandmother's driveway on the morning of his disappearance. Now, these are the cars that William's foster mother told police about on September 18th, 2014. So police knew about these cars since nearly the beginning, but waited about a year to release the information to the public. Yeah, that seems odd. I know. I mean, with something like that, like you want witnesses, you want somebody to be like, oh, yeah, no, that's my neighbor's boyfriend's car. Like, that's why it was there, you know? Yeah. Just, yes, I found that to be kind of odd. And this is also when the triple zero call that William's foster mother made was released. So right around the same time. Mm -hmm. So that one year mark was huge in this case, because this is also when that 60 Minutes Australia interview that I mentioned earlier aired. In it, William's foster parents sit down with host Michael Usher, and they tell their heart-wrenching story of the morning William disappeared. I couldn't see him. I couldn't hear him. It was the world, you know, it's like the world just came to a screaming halt. I just, there was no wind. There were no birds. There was no movement. There was nothing. And I'm looking out around this garden, I'm thinking, where are you? And I've just said, William, where are you? You need to talk to me. I can't see you. Where are you? And there was nothing. The interview was full of tears, not just from the foster parents, but from Michael Usher himself. It's hard not to empathize with these parents who were still just as shattered a year later as they were on the day William vanished. Lead investigator Gary Jubelin was also interviewed for this piece, and he says that the Foster family has been cleared of any involvement in William's disappearance, and he goes on to talk about his belief that this was a stranger abduction. He believes that the idea of an opportunistic stranger coming onto the property and snatching William is far-fetched because it's too dangerous. Instead, he told Usher that he believed William ran down the driveway in anticipation of his father's arrival and went on to the roadway looking for him. He told Usher, quote, Then if somebody who has the propensity to commit an evil act like this decides, this is a situation I'm going to take advantage of, and that's why we call it an opportunistic situation, opportunistic crime, end quote. Well, yeah, it would have to be. I mean, if if we're going with the theory that this is a stranger abduction, like they wouldn't have known that this kid was going to be there. It's not like yeah. this was like a, a planned or announced visit where there was going to be kids known to be in the area. Exactly. And, you know, it sounds like they have visited this house before, but not in any, you know, regular way. Right. right. There's no predictable, no regular, predictable schedule. schedule. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and they they show up at what ten, you said ten thirty the night before. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, yeah, they it was earlier than that, but yeah, they showed up the night before, and they weren't even supposed to come till Friday. So they weren't. They came Thursday evening when they were supposed to come Friday evening. Right. So it's like completely it's, unpredictable. Yeah, it's ten thirty in the morning on Friday. They never would have been there at that time. So it definitely wasn't targeted at the house, or but maybe maybe the neighborhood. Yeah, maybe I don't know. But it all just seems very unlikely. Right. So Usher also believes, and this part I I think makes a lot of sense, that the Spider-Man suit could have played into this as it allowed the abductor to create an immediate rapport with the boy. Mm. Jubilin imagines that the abductor said something like, hey, Spider-Man, and managed to get close that way. Yeah. Criminal profiler Dr. Sarah Ewell also worked on the police task force. She agrees that the kidnapping was most likely an opportunistic crime because the family was not supposed to be there at the time. There was also a narrow window to take the child from outside the property as the home was located on a dead end street. Right. So they're really just it wasn't easy to make like a quick getaway, you know. So by this point, the Williams bedding thing was very much still going on and police were heavily looking into the pedophile ring in the area as well. During the course of this investigation, investigators linked the pedophile ring to a local group of senior citizens. Uh. This group called GAPA 
for grandparents as parents again, was formed by Uniting Care Burside and the Country Women's Association. In the years since Williams' disappearance, two members of the group, including the former president, were charged with indecently assaulting children. The president, Paul Bickford, was sentenced to a 16-month suspended sentence for indecently assaulting an 11-year-old girl with autism while driving her to buy candy. This is disgusting. Yeah. Another member, Anthony Jones, was convicted of indecently assaulting a different 11-year-old child. Now, it doesn't sound like this group had any direct ties. Like, I don't think the grandmother was in this group, for instance, Mm -hmm. but it was a group that was local to her house. I'd be curious, like, be curious what that means exactly. Yeah. Police interviewed not only the convicted predators, but their families as well. And it doesn't appear that they were ever able to make any link between them and William's disappearance. And that's going to be where we end this week at the one year mark of William's disappearance. Ah. Uh, yeah, so what do you think so far? What are your thoughts? Okay. Before I, we move on to like the next 8 years. I'm having a real hard time with this being an opportunistic crime. Yeah. Uh, if if these two vehicles were there to scout for kids, like each house has an acre lot. It's a dead end street everybody has driveways there's it would be out of place for a car to be parked on the street like all of that does not lead to an easy opportunistic abduction right right so it seems to me that it was more targeted especially given his family history right what do you mean well william's family history of you know being in foster care his biological parents and all of their turmoil and yes, sure. It's all been, they've all been cleared, but it just like, it's a coincidence and I don't, I don't like coincidences in these cases. And like I said, it's not a neighborhood that would be conducive to scouting and sitting and waiting for a kid to come out. No, because you would be noticed. Right. And it's not, it's not like there's a playground or yeah. someplace that you would predictably find children. Right. Yeah, there, so there's ha- no reason to I'm think just, that they would be there. Yeah, I'm just having a real hard time with this being opportunistic. Yeah, and even if Jubilin's theory that he ran down the driveway and went onto the roadway, it's like, how why does would that they timing work? Yeah. Right, yes. Why would, they, why would they be sitting in that neighborhood? Right. But then, okay, so then you get to, well, was it somebody in the family, right? And... What we typically see in these cases in which the family comes under suspicion after reporting a child missing is going back again to Orn and Orson West. And then also with Cody Bigsby, the two big things in those cases is that police came to believe that the children actually went missing way before right. they were reported missing. Right. And but we have case, evidence. Yeah, we know minutes. that to not be true. Yeah. Right. And it's 2014. We're not talking about 1972. Like, she took that photo with an iPhone. There's yeah. metadata. Right. You can easily prove when and where that photo was taken. Right. And then, in addition, and they don't, you know, release this right away, but there's surveillance video from like a restaurant that the family stopped at the night before on mm-hmm. their on the drive down, mm-hmm. right? So like there are multiple data points that corroborate that William was there when they said he was. Right. So that's what makes it so tricky. And so that's why like the theory of, you know, oh, the parents might have done something to him, like that doesn't exactly make sense either. But one thing that's extremely clear is that he didn't just wander off. I mean, because they did that search for a week. And like I said, I mean, if he had gone into the bush or a creature had taken him, there would have been a sign, right. you know, like there would have been torn fabric. There would have been blood. blood. There would have been anything. Right. And they found nothing there. The dogs would have been able to get a scent out there. Right. But they never did. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely sold on an abduction in, into a vehicle. What, what I'm not sold on is that it was just happenstance that these people were there. That's, right. That's where I'm, 
hung up on. Yeah. Or that the cars were just parked across the street. Yeah. And yeah, so I don't know. I don't know. It's really, really confusing. And that's why this is a two parter. (laughs) So next week, or right after this, for those of you who are on Patreon or Apple Podcasts, we are going to cover the investigation from 2015 to the present. And when I say the present, I mean up to about six weeks prior to us recording this. Okay. Yeah, that's when some of these articles are from. So like this is very much an active case even nine years later. So stay tuned for part two coming next week or right now if you subscribe on Patreon or Apple Podcasts. Terrell has been missing from Kendall, New South Wales, Australia since September 12th, 2014. He is a white male with brown hair and hazel eyes. He was last seen wearing a two-piece Spider-Man costume. William was three years old when he went missing. He would be 12 today. Anyone with information on the disappearance of William Terrell is urged to call Crime Stoppers at 1-800-333-000. There's a $1 million reward in this case. You can see all the sources for this episode along with photos and videos at our website, and then they were gone.com. And be sure to follow us on social, and then they were gone pod on Facebook and at ATTWG pod on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe and consider leaving a five star review on Apple Podcasts. It will help new listeners find us. And the more people that listen, the more chances we have of bringing someone home. And we'll see you here next week for a brand new episode. See you next week. And Then They Were Gone is hosted by Kona Gallagher and Ethan Flick. All research, writing, and editing is done by me, Kona Gallagher. Theme music is The Stork by Ketza. Additional music is provided by Kai Engel. And Then They Were Gone is a Little Monster production. Hey, you can do it!